morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church on a beautiful, cold, chilly Sunday morning. We are so glad that you have found space among us to worship. And those of you who are joining us from home, we welcome you as well. Today is Baptism of the Lord Sunday, where we remember the baptism of Jesus as well as our own baptism. Later in the service, we will come forward to remember together with the basin of water on the Lord's table. If you're joining us from home, I encourage you to fill a bowl with water and have it available for that part of the service. Over the season of Epiphany, which is explained in your bulletin, we have this few weeks of a season where we grow together. And we're going in this season to look together at the character and nature of God and as we read through the Psalms. So I hope that you will follow along with us as we reveal epiphanies about God together. I do have a few announcements for us today. First, I remind you that tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and along with government offices and banks, our church office and ELC will be closed. But of course, because we are honoring one of our Baptist saints tomorrow, I hope that you will take the day to remember King's legacy with study or service and remember what it means that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made such a difference in our country. Also, I have a few things to point out in your bulletin. Our hardworking flower committee is asking for your help this year as they seek to improve upon and add to some of our worship materials. Everything from Christmas trees to pyramids to adding worship banners to the sanctuary, Check out the list in your bulletin or your e-newsletter. There's a wish list of things they'd like to have, and if you would like to donate, you can do that in honor or memory of a loved one. Also, we continue to receive pledge cards for our campaign for 2024, and if you have not had a chance to submit your pledge yet, that is okay. You can send that to Kaylee anytime, and she will update our pledge totals for the year. Also, if you have not received your offering envelopes, they should be coming in the mail any day. Our FBC kids will begin again on Thursday night, uh, what we're calling Thursday Night Church. So this is kids ages 4 to 10 learning together and growing their faith. And that will happen with Pastor Caroline in this front classroom as you head down the office hallway. So I encourage you to bring uh, your children or your grandchildren to come and learn together. We will also have space in the nursery for younger children. And we continue with our donations for the Warming Center and Patrick Henry Elementary School. If you would like to donate, you can always drop those off at the missions room. And if you're able to deliver donations periodically, you can contact the church office and we will let you know when we have items to bring over. And if you haven't seen it yet, our FBC Missions Year in Review for 2023 is now available. It is linked on our website and in your e-newsletter. We also have a few printed copies in the narthex. This wonderful document, put together by our own Linda Dore, highlights the many ways that First Baptist has been involved in missions in the last year. So many thanks to Linda for helping us to see the powerful ways that our giving, our time, has served Christ and God's kingdom here in our community and around the world. Thank you, church, for living Jesus' command to love this world as God loves us. Now, I ask that you call yourself into God's presence. We'll do this together with a responsive litany that you can find in your bulletin. I'll read the regular print, and you can respond in the bold print. We worship the God who inhabits our world and indwells our lives. We need not look up to find God. We need only to look around, within ourselves, beyond ourselves, into the eyes of others. We need not listen for a distant thunder to find God. We need only listen to the music of life, the words of the children, the questions of the curious, the rhythm of our heartbeat. We worship the God who inhabits our world and indwells our lives. Let us worship with our whole selves, knowing we are created, beloved, and made holy. Will you pray with me? Loving God, you know us better than we know ourselves. 
Our prayers are in your heart, even before they are on our lips. And yet we must utter our prayers. We must proclaim our praise of you and all your wondrous creation. Your love surrounds us, and you have promised to be with us always. You know our heart's desire to serve you. We pray that you will keep us true to that desire as we worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I invite you to stand as you are able and to join in singing hymn number 77. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, hymn number 77. So first of all, apologies that I am not Marsha Frith. Um, I assure you I'm working on it, uh, but hopefully I can fill in for her today. Our Old Testament reading is Psalm chapter 139, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. 
You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I invite our children forward. Come have a seat with me. Yeah. Well, welcome. We're having children's worship time on a special Sunday. Did you guys hear what Sunday it is? Yes. What is it? That's right, the day we remember when we got baptized. Yeah, most of the people in this room have been baptized. That's pretty amazing. We heard in our story today that even Jesus was baptized. Y'all see this picture? Yes. Now, you grown-ups can't see it so well, but it's a picture of John and his camel hair and Jesus in the water. They're in the Jordan River, and John has just baptized Jesus. What's up here? A dove. A dove, that's right. So our story says that the, the heavens opened up, God spoke to Jesus, and it looked like a dove came down. Yeah. Um, so, so, so when, when, when God came out of the water, God's spirit came. That's right. That's what the dove is like. It's like God's spirit it came down, and it said, This is my son who's beloved. I am well pleased. And this is when Jesus first started teaching. So he was baptized before he started teaching. The people look like they're like, what? They had, they're watching. They're probably pretty amazed that God's speaking, right? Yeah, those are, those are good facial expressions. You see that? <laughs> well, John was a prophet. He came before Jesus, and he knew that Jesus was the chosen one of God, that Jesus had come to save us. And so John was baptizing lots of people. He would dunk them down into the river, remind them to be washed clean of all their wrongdoings, and then to follow God. Don't do it for two seconds. Like, oh, back up. Yeah, it's pretty quick. 
You wouldn't want to hold somebody underwater too long. That would not be good. <laughs> well, Jesus asked John, he said, will you baptize me too? I mean, Jesus didn't do anything wrong, right? So he didn't have to be baptized to wash away sins. But he was teaching us what we should do, that we should be baptized too. And so this started Jesus' ministry, showing us how to be baptized. And when he came up out of the water, God says, and this is God's spirit, the dove, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. So when we choose to follow Jesus and we get baptized, we can also feel God's presence. It may not come as a dove exactly, but somehow we know deep in our hearts that God speaks to us. Today, do you see this basin on the table? Yes. The grown-ups are all going to remember their baptisms together. Yeah, we're going to dip our hands into the water. We're going to touch our hands or our forehead and remember that we got wet, just like Jesus did, remembering that God forgives us, washes us clean. Yeah, we'll let you walk up and try it too. Most of us in this room probably were just a little bit older than y'all are when we got baptized. Some of us grew up in different traditions. We might have been sprinkled when we were babies. And some of us were grown-ups when we got baptized. That's pretty amazing, right? So we're Baptist, right? You know, Baptist comes from the word baptism. You know, John the Baptist, he baptized people. Well, Baptists are known for asking people to follow Jesus and then take them up to the baptismal pool up there behind the choir. And we put them down into the water, cover them totally. We call that immersing them. And we remember how Jesus was baptized in the river. And when we are washed clean, we, re- we remember that we're starting a new relationship with Jesus when we choose to follow him. Some of you might just remember a baptism we had here. What's this a picture of? Hey, there's Miss Beth. There's Miss Beth, that's right. And there's you. And there's me, where am I? You're right here, you're right here. What, where, 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 what are we standing in? In the baptism pool. In the baptismal pool, it was all full of water up there. And we came out, and Miss Beth said, I believe in Jesus. And then I ducked her back in the water, and she came up, and she had been baptized. So this bowl of water, when we touch it, we are reminded of when we went up to the baptismal pool. Is it cold or hot? We try to keep it warm. We don't want to freeze you. (laughs) When we are washed clean by this water, by God's Spirit, we are made new. And you know, both of you one day might get baptized, and we'll go up there to the big baptistry behind the choir and dip you down just like Jesus was baptized in the river. Oh, there's some steps. You have to walk a long way. <laughs> I know, because this carriage showed me. Oh, yeah, you took a tour one time? Yeah, it's from right there from the upstairs, and there's stairs right there. Like, see, if you look at the Yeah, there's stairs, stairs, that's right. So you have to go a long way. But we get up there, we baptize, and we remember just how exciting it is to follow Jesus and that newness of knowing Jesus. I want to get baptized. Yeah, we'll have to talk about that some more. So when we choose to follow Jesus, when anybody chooses to follow Jesus and chooses to get baptized, we will rejoice with you. We'll be excited just like God was when Jesus got baptized. And we'll say, you are beloved and we are pleased with you. All right, let's say a prayer before you guys go back to your seats. We'll do an echo prayer. You grown-ups can help. Loving God, thank you for baptism that reminds us of how much you love us. Amen. I invite you to stand again as you are able and to join as we sing hymn number 458, Search Me, O God, number 458. I pray. 
today as we reaffirm our commitment to God and Jesus Christ and remember our baptisms, we also commit ourselves to furthering God's kingdom on earth. And to that end, we bring our offerings, our offerings of time and money and talent to the altar during this part of our worship service. May we remember our baptisms, remember our commitment, and remember the grace of God as we present these gifts. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we come today with joy for your baptism. We come with praise for your glory. We come with gratitude for your love. As we offer these gifts to you, send your spirit upon us that our hands and our hearts may do your work in the world. As we offer our lives to you, bless us with your strength, that we may join with you to work for the blessing of peace throughout this world.
as I mentioned earlier, we're going to spend some time with the psalmist for the next few weeks. And today's psalm, Psalm 139, is one that many of us have read before. It's very familiar to us. But I've wondered if we've thought about what it means, at least recently. Have we dug into what this passage means about who we are and who God is? One thing that jumped out to me as I studied for this was that we humans really want our privacy. Especially in American culture today, right? More than ever before, we silo ourselves off. We have our separate houses. We don't know our neighbors. We keep to ourselves. It's a live and let live kind of world. And when people invade our privacy in some way, find out something they shouldn't, whether they mean to or not, we end up feeling kind of violated, maybe ashamed. We are guarded about who we open ourselves up to. It's scary to think of being that vulnerable to anyone. And yet, on some level, we also all have a desperate and deep desire for another person to know us truly, fully, to understand us. And so it's quite a conundrum, isn't it? You know, I'm always amazed at sometimes how even church family, how, how little we know each other. We might have a sense of each other based on how we interact at church. We might know if someone's having surgery or has the flu. But we don't often know people's hardest struggles. Because it takes courage to be that honest, and it takes grace for us to hear and respond appropriately. As I was, as I was thinking about our psalm today, I was thinking about what it might feel like to be fully known. I mean, the psalmist says it over and over. There's, there's a lot of talk of knowledge. What does it mean to be fully known? And also, I was thinking how hard it is for us as humans, might even be totally incapable of it, of knowing someone all that well. Do you guys remember the movie, and, well, it's a book and movie adaptations called Freaky Friday? Oh, yeah, yeah, we, you guys remember. And the storylines are similar in the book, the movies. There's this single or remarried mom and her teenage daughter. They are drastically different from each other. And they cannot seem to communicate or understand each other. And so they drive each other absolutely nuts. And there's this moment of magic of some sort. And in the 2003 movie adaptation that I know best, there was a fortune given at the Chinese restaurant. And the next day, the mother and the daughter wake up to discover that somehow they have swapped bodies. And they can't immediately switch back, and so they are forced to masquerade as one another until a solution can be found. And the result, of course, is both hilarious and painful to watch. The daughter thinks her mother is uncool and harsh, the mother thinks the daughter is shallow and argumentative, but as they live each other's lives, they begin to appreciate more deeply what the other one is going through. And in the process of figuring out the fortune and how to break the curse, they develop this new sense of respect and understanding for one another. They end up breaking the curse by realizing just how wrong they were about each other. And, you know, I think that this craze of movies, and there's more than just Freaky Friday, where there's this body-switching plot, I think it's of strong interest because it plays on our innate fears of having someone else really know the ins and outs of being, well, us, right? Also, I think it helps us to remember that, you know, we have to walk in someone else's shoes to even begin to understand one another more deeply. And still, as humans, we're going to fail at it because of our own limitations, because we can't actually body swap, <laughs> and because of our own selfishness sometimes, because 
we probably don't really seek to know people with that kind of depth most of the time. It's just too much trouble. But what does it mean when our psalmist says that God knows our inmost being? I'll be honest, growing up in really relatively fundamentalist churches, this knowledge of God was mostly used in a very punitive way. That kind of fear of God is watching, so you better shape up. Don't you ever think a bad thought or God will get you. And to be honest, there are parts of the rest of this psalm that we don't read in our lectionary passage that do give us a sense that the psalmist appreciates having God's discipline and guidance in his life. But what I think that this overemphasis on interpreting this punitive work of God does, you know, that God is watching invasion of our most intimate moments, what this emphasis does is to make God's presence some sort of horrifying moment. Someone prying into our lives, peeking around every corner, rather than to remind us of God's love and presence that's life-giving, that's hopeful. When we read the psalm, there isn't a sense of anxiety about having God know us so deeply. Because God simply isn't like other humans. The psalmist is speaking of this transcendent creator, way above and beyond us, while also holding in pension the same God who cares for us so deeply. Every piece of creation loves deeply. There's divine knowledge of the very most intimate parts of our lives, and it's beautiful and safe. I really think that this section of this psalm answers that profound question we all have. Who am I? Who is God? In beautiful, not terrifying ways. One pastor put it this way, the general spirit of this psalm is not fear, but trust. Not guilt, but praise. Not judgment, but grace. The psalmist isn't feeling shame that God is present, that God knows everything. Instead, the psalmist feels connected, made right, known, understood. Presbyterian pastor Dr. Alan McSween said that Psalm 139 invites us to receive an identity rooted not in the things we say about ourselves or the labels that others assign to us, but in the one who knows us more deeply and more lovingly than we could ever know ourselves. And yet, in our darkest hours, we are still asking the question, aren't we? You may have heard of a pastor and, and a theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He lived in Nazi Germany. And he was imprisoned by the Nazis in World War II for his conspiracy to rescue Jews and do away with Adolf Hitler. And he wrote a poem while in jail entitled, Who Am I? And at the very end of this poem, he gives a sort of answer. Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. To know who we are is to know who God is, because we are God's creation. I had a wonderful conversation recently with one of our most prayerful church members, and she said to me, you know, there's just a God-shaped hole in each of us. We are made to be known deeply in our souls by God. There is a space made just for God in each and every human being. And we reflect that love of God in our very creation, in who we are. And we deeply seek for God's presence, whether we are fully aware of it or not, whether we fight against it or not. When the psalmist says that God knows, what does God know? Us. That 
hollow feeling that no one understands what we're going through, that painful realization that others have abandoned us in our time of need, that horrifying and grief-filled moment when everyone important in our lives is gone, that's when we need to know that God knows. You know, I realized something in all my study about what God knows here. And that's that God didn't really send Jesus to come to earth and see what it was like to be human. Though certainly, of course, this enfleshes what the psalmist is already knowing to be true long before Jesus came to earth. And that is that God has known us from the depths before we even knew ourselves. So this psalm, it's not about a peeping Tom God. It's not meant to be used for fear, far from it. This psalm is about our very identity as humans created by a loving creator. It tells us that God, the very creator of the whole universe, loves each and every one of us fully. And thus, our lives have worth, a worth that no one can take from us, whether ourselves or anyone else. So those moments that you feel undervalued or unloved, the psalmist's word is for you. Those moments that you feel like you've let everyone down, the psalmist's word is for you. Those moments when you feel like the world might be better off without you. This psalmist's word is for you. Because our lives have intrinsic value. They aren't worth something because of what we've done well, or what we own, or what other people think of us. Our worth comes from a God who knows us and names us and whose love for us we will never be separated from. Just as Paul wrote to the Roman church in Romans 8, many of you know the passage well, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, the character of God is not to rain, immediately rain judgment, separate it from us at a moment's notice for every petty sin because God is watching. Our epiphany about God today shouldn't be simply that God is watching, but that God knows us, like really knows us and loves us all the same. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. So as we consider the character of God as seen through the psalmist, I think we see that same God reaching down from heaven to honor Jesus at his baptism. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. When we choose to follow Jesus, to commune with the God of the universe who chose to come and live among us, we experience something akin to that psalmist's deep and profound belovedness as we are washed in the waters of baptism. We are reminded that we, too, are given that meaning and worth by the same one who chose to form us from the dust of the earth with intention and love. We are given guidance to love as God has loved us. We are transformed from that unworthiness we feel to the powerful worth that God has given us in our creation and recreation and baptism. So as we remember the holy space of baptism, I hope that we can also remember the ways God's love continues to envelop us, just as the waters did. I hope that we can, again, feel what the psalmist felt, that we are known, understood, 
loved, able to reflect God's light because of the deep, deep love of God and Jesus Christ. We have come to the part of our service where we will remember the work of God in our own lives through Jesus. We come to this water to encounter God's presence anew and to be inspired to tell this amazing story of love and grace over again. We come to reaffirm the blessing we have received through our baptism. And we remember that in baptism, God's Saving actions happen throughout history and happened in our own lives as God called our names. In baptism, we feel the presence of God wash over us, all around us, knowing that we are beloved and never alone. So as beloved children of God, we gather today at these waters of baptism. We reaffirm our commitment to Christ together and we experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. Will you join me in a responsive litany? You can find this in your bulletin as we remember our baptism and affirm our commitment to tell our story together. Dear friends, on this day of recreation, we recall Christ's baptism and we claim and remember our own. We gather at this font of living water to celebrate the gift of God's redeeming grace. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, male or female, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Now let us affirm our faith. Do you reaffirm and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ and his kingdom? If so, say I do. I do. Do you believe in God? I believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth. Do you trust in the spirit as guide? I trust that God's Spirit flows where it will, inspiring me. Will you continue in the disciples' teaching and community, in the breaking of bread and in prayer? I will, for God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being? I will, for God's help. May it be so. And in this and all we do, Keep us faithful to our Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Today we honor the grace that God gives us in the waters of baptism. And we recognize God's naming presence in our lives. So will you pray with me? God who names us and calls us, we are grateful for our baptism. God who creates us and sends us, recreates us and makes us new, we are delighted to be transformed. God who washes us clean, we joyfully embrace your forgiveness. God who conquers death, we hope in your eternity. May we be your people, remembering all you have done, are doing, and will do among us. May we tell your story of grace and forgiveness in our own lives, as we remember together. Join me in a response. 
Now bless by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water, that by it we may be reminded of our baptism into Jesus Christ, and that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may be kept faithful until you receive us at last in your eternal home. Glory to you, eternal God, the one who was and is and shall always be. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful today. I'll ask that you come forward at this time, as you are able. You can sanitize your hands here, and then come forward, dip your finger into this basin of water. You can touch your forehead or your hand, and remember the waters of baptism. You can come up the center aisle and return by the side aisles. Also, this basin of water will be available in the narthex as you exit, if you are unable to come up at this time. I encourage you as you return to your seat to say a prayer of thanksgiving for your baptism. And once everyone has had a chance to participate, we will close the service with a hymn and a benediction. We hope that you feel the closeness of a God whose spirit washes over you, and that you too are God's beloved child, given grace and abundant mercy on this journey of faith.
I invite you to stand and to sing with me our song of response, number 543. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas, number 543. sustains you. The God who calls you also goes with you. The God who loved you before you were born still loves you today and into all of your tomorrow. 